Good morning, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Joachim Reitner today. Uh, Joachim's from the University of Göttingen. He received his undergrad and PhD education at Tübingen. Uh, his PhD was in carbonate platforms uh, in the Cretaceous. He then spent 10 years in Berlin uh, at the Free Uni Freie University there as a postdoc and assistant professor before moving to Göttingen as head of department in 1994, where they established one of the world's first geobiology groups. So, George, you think you had it bad, mate. <laughs> That's 24 <laughs> years ago. So... Um, yeah, uh, where uh, Joachim is still uh, head of department at the Geobiology Institute at Göttingen, uh, where I met him uh, when I was there on sabbatical about four years ago. Um, so he, today he's going to give us a talk uh, on the research activities of uh, himself and his group in the early Archean carbon archives. So thank you, Joachim. Okay. Ah. Yeah, Andrew, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and I also thank you for the invitation to, to give a talk to tell you something about what you are doing recently. So there's one of my, my new research fields. So I have started to work on that in 2011, so it's not a long time ago. But I, I had the feeling that especially the early Aichin is so different to the rest of the geology on this earth, and I've learned a lot. So from my education, I'm more a, a biologist, paleontologist, and carbonate sedimentologist, so I'm not so familiar in the early beginning with all of these old rocks. Uh, they're really old rocks. And uh, I will give you a, a short overview and said what we are doing. And, there are two systems. So one are, of course, the carbonates, then the uh, chirts, the black chirts, and also barite. So these three systems are bearing a lot of intriguing uh, or organic matter things, and we can learn something about the processes of the early Earth. And uh, uh, especially as a place in, in Western Australia, that's here. Maybe it's easier to go, go here. And it is a very famous terrain. So it is a, a Pilbara area, and uh, I think that's the only place on Earth, maybe except from, from South Africa, when you have a relatively well-preserved rock, so the metamorphosis is very low. And uh, so all the organic signatures and also other signatures are well preserved. What you see here is a lot of this brownish, honey yellow structures. They are early granites. And, and you see here the green belts, uh, really the greenstone belts, or the old ocean systems. And I've noticed here the North Pole granite. There's a tiny little thing here. So this is the oldest known there with an age of roughly 3.45 uh, billion years. And uh, North Pole is funny because it is one of the hottest areas in the world. And uh, it's a famous for gold. And so the early gold diggers uh, went to this place and it was so hot. It's 50 degrees and more uh, centigrade, uh, of course. And so they have dreamed of, of, an, of a very cold place. And, and so it was North Pole for them. And so for this reason, this area is called North Pole. OK, and all here in this area, this dark green, greenish uh, place with lots of this uh, greenstone beds. That is maybe the place where you can study early life uh, very easily. Uh, the access is a bit uh, complicated here. That is the Shore River. And there is a track, and you, and you can go in here. Yeah, that is the stratigraphy of that. So the oldest rocks, meanwhile, are around uh, 3.6 billion years. So that is quite old. And you see, well, a lot of this 
basalts, so the greenstone belts. So the oldest one, no star basalt, and Mount Ada, or the Ada, what, how do you pronounce it, and the famous apex. So many of you know what the problem with apex is. And then we have the youngest system, the Euro basalt, but Okay, of course, it's not the money, but it's. And uh, then you have some other things. Here's the church. Uh, so the dress formation is full with church, black church. That's different things, so the abundant uh, church systems. Maybe a famous one is also this marble bar church. And uh, I want not to talk about that. Then the shop locality was this famous so called microfossils. Uh, and the Shelley pool, the Shelley pool system. And I will give you uh, some ideas on uh, carbonates what we have found in, in this greenstone belt systems, then in this uh, black church, and associated here with this uh, black church, and, and, and also the basalts are abundant uh, black barite systems. Yeah, we will start with the carbonates, and I've listed here uh, five topics. So the main carbonates, so the most of the carbonates are related here with in, in the pilopasite interspace, and also we have deep veins with, with carbonates. Then we have uh, manganese, manganese dolomite microbialites in the, in the dresser formation. And we have manganese-rich carbonates on organic flakes, uh, tiny little, tiny little grains uh, located on keratinous flakes. We will see what it is. And then, of course, uh, the famous stellipus stomatolites and also other things, microbialites. And also we have carbonates in, in the black barite. And that is also a very intriguing system. Yeah, why are the carbonates so important? So I like carbonates, so this may be something what I had from my PhD time, so I like carbonates. So I grew up in the, in the Alpine area and uh, there's carbonates and I wanted to know more about carbonates, so that is the reason. And also, the carbonates are on Earth are very important. You see, 5% of, of, uh, of the carbon sources are carbonates, and I think that is unique in the solar system. We're always looking also on Mars for carbonates. There uh, are not so many, except maybe from iron carbonates. So carbonates are really an important rock type on Earth, and so most of them today are of biogenic origin. Because before we start to go a little bit deeper in, in this carbonate uh, thing, so I have to tell you something what I think it's important. So how the carbonates are formed. And uh, I will focus it mainly on, on this organic control on that, and so we can uh, differentiate uh, three, three types. So what we call organomineralization. We'll show you soon what it is. And this microbially induced exopolymeric substance, uh, EPS mineralization, and then uh, the true uh, biomineralization, but I, I will not talk about that. And of course, we need also uh, the chemical environments, what is important for the formation of carbonates. So the carbonate alkalinity normally plays an, a central role, especially in the speed of the precipitation. Yeah, that is uh, some models what we think are important. So that based on the early concepts of the uh, matrix-related uh, formation of, uh, of uh, biominerals. And the idea behind this is that we have a special set of organic molecules which are acidic. And most of them are special type of uh, proteins and also sugars. And that, what we have learned also from experiments, that especially the carboxylic groups uh, play the main role in capturing uh, divalent cations. And if the distances between uh, these groups have 
certain distance, like uh, I have forgotten San Angstrom, so it also determines the type of uh, carbonate mineral what, uh, what's going on. And so we, we have learned that there are very thin, thin molecular layers on, on uh, some frame building matrices, and it is a unique system. So everywhere that we have studied in, in the systems, also in the deep biosphere, and uh, formation of, of uh, carbonate precipitation and fractures, it's always the same. Yeah, that is an uh, example how it looks like. And you see here the sausage-like structures that uh, dehydrated exopolymeric molecules. And you see uh, here's this uh, base layer, the CO01 layer. That is the interface between the organic molecules and uh, the beginning of the growth of, a, in this case, a calcite crystal. And that is, uh, we have made a lot of experiments to do that, but it is from a natural environment, from, from a deep underwater cave in the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, that summarizes a bit this concept behind that. So this organomineralization means so we have a, a type of organic matter which is not, so we do not see uh, an, any, any uh, biological control on that. So we have learned that lots of these complex molecules are also can uh, group together on, on surfaces, and has, but they have the same function. And that's what we have seen from this EPS-controlled uh, uh, preci uh, precipitation of, of, of carbonates, especially as these exopolymeric things are. That is uh, the, major, uh, the major process on Earth, I think, in the moment. And then uh, the yeah, enzymatically controlled biomineralization, but it is another topic. But I think for, for our... Uh, uh, investigation in the early the early carbonates, so maybe the organomineralization, and also here's this EPS related is important, except uh, also some some abiotic precipitation. What we want to we see. So the most <laughs> carbonates we have uh, found in uh, in, uh, in the spaces between between the pillows and all of that. So the oldest one in the North Star, Mount Ada, Apex, and Euro, everywhere is the same. But in the, in the younger basalts, so the 3.2, so we haven't seen that yet. So this has something to do with the, with the type of the basalts and also with the, maybe with the chemistry of the seawater. So it looks like that is uh, the 3.2. Uh, for uh, seven giga year old uh, Mount Ada pillow basalts. Uh, you see here the wet uh, pillow basalts. Uh, here on the margin is relatively fresh. That are uh, higher clastic zones, so the, the glass rims. And here in the inner space, you see uh, the, yeah, maybe the oxidized iron rich uh, carbonates. The white is uh, dirty matrix. And also associated here with deep, with deep fractures. So I found them last year, and they're really deep. And they maybe they have a bit of different uh, history, like uh, like this in the pillow <coughs> uh, carbonates. So we have a closer look uh, to the chemistry of that. That was very surprising to see that uh, most of those carbonates are calcite. We have a bit, a bit dolomite and, and also anchorite uh, could, be, could be important. But it, I was very surprised to see that we have uh, the calcite precipitation there. Yeah, the rare earth element analysis show that, uh, of course, we have a strong hydrothermal uh, influence here. You see the European anomaly is very high. But when we go and have a look uh, by, the, by the carbonates, so we see besides the europium, also the yttrium 
anomalies. It means so we have a very strong uh, influence of, of seawater. So we have a very strong uh, water-rock interaction here with, uh, with this glassy rim structures. And so it's clear, and we will also see from, uh, from the isotopic signatures that uh, these carbonates are not uh, really a hydrothermal origin. So they are precipitated from, from uh, seawater. So the stable isotopes, or the carbon isotopes, give us also some intriguing hints. So the first phase uh, here, the, uh, the white uh, calcite here, that is the early beginning and in all cases. So we have uh, in the first cement generation uh, values of, of the, the delta certain C of always around zero, maybe plus one, minus one, but uh, it's in, it doesn't matter if it is uh, North Pole, uh, the, uh, the North Star basalt or the Euro basalt, it's always the same. And then we have here this, this honey yellow stuff that is more anchorite, so we have much heavier <coughs> uh, carbon uh, values, and uh, that is in the moment a bit of problem because I, I have no idea why we have uh, so heavy carbon here uh, in this in this system. But it's clear that, that the first generation is the carbon isotopes are very close uh, to seawater, also the modern seawater has this signature. So the dissolved inorganic carbon has, uh, the, the dick values are around zero. And uh, as a, the second process is also the the formation of chert. So we have, uh, due to this water-rock interaction, so we have also uh, uh, the formation of high amounts of chert, and uh, so probably a very viscous type of uh, silica fluids, which are also moving uh, through the basalts and concentrating in, in this uh, chert veins, what we will see later. Yeah, that gives us, a, again, uh, this information that this uh, uh, values around uh, zero is it's very characteristic for this early carbonate. So that definitely the, the carbon source is not from the mantle, so it's, it's from, from the seawater. Uh, we had luck, that's a bit complicated to to obtain uh, the strontium, the radiogenic uh, strontium isotopes. But also this uh, values give us an idea that probably seawater plays an important role there. Yeah, I told you that we are, we are interested in the, also in the organic carbon, but uh, we have not found much. The only thing is that some of the associated pyrite has uh, some uh, traces of organic matter, but uh, the truths and also the carbonates are more or less free from uh, uh, organic carbon. So this is uh, yeah, data based on relatively fresh material, what we obtain from, from drill holes. So we have not so much uh, influence from from outside, so the diatronic, the diatronic is uh, very weak, and, and so we haven't seen any big alteration, except of the mal uh, material, what we see uh, uh, <coughs> on, the, on, the, on the soil, closely related to the soils. Yeah, the idea is the formation of that. I've already told a bit about that, that we have lots of seawater pumping through this uh, oceanic crust, and, and so we have a, a very heavy reaction on, on this glassy rims. And when you have a closer look uh, to, to all of this alteration zones, you see a very complex uh, set of uh, liberation of, uh, of cations. And Andrew, you see here this, this dark rims, and these dark rims are titanium oxide. 
And sometimes, those are the exceptions. So we have here versus titanium oxide also some, some uh, weak uh, concentrations of organic matter. No. But important for us is that we have the release of the, of the cations uh, here in this environment. And, and so we also speculate that we have an increased alkalinity. And so uh, we have a very fast precipitation here of this, of this carbonate. But it is nothing else than a natural CO2 sequestration uh, system. And I think uh, that lowers the CO2 values from the seawater significantly. And it is a, a model <coughs> how it looks like, a bit of reconstruction of the of the early Archean situation. So we have this early granites. We have here the plants, the chromatic material was coming up. A lot of volcanisms, so we see that, uh, the release of CO2 and, and all of that, what we expect. And here the formation of this, of this carbonates, not directly on the, on the surface of the, of the pillow basalts, but some meters inside. And maybe also, that is maybe a bit uh, speculation. There is a discussion on that. If, if we have a type of a shallow subduction and uh, decarbonation again, and, and so we have a type of a circle. So it's a bit of problem that I think uh, classical uh, plate tectonics does not work in this time. So, so maybe that is an answer for that. And uh, OK. We believe that all of this uh, silicate material is liberated by or dissolved by, by the CO2. This is nothing else than a type of a silica weathering. And uh, so for this case, uh, we have the formation finally of the carbonates and also uh, the silica fluids, which are, we will see uh, are very prominent uh, in this time. That also give you some idea on, on some small shelf areas, but uh, typical sediments uh, like today, so we do not have at this time. So most of the sediments here on the seafloor are chemical sediments and a type of uh, precipitated uh, silica fluids, but not much uh, of uh, sandstone or the sand type. Uh, sediments or something like that. The second uh, very strange carbonate system what we have found is uh, closely related in the, in the dresser formation that's also very old, with 3.5 billion years. And that is embedded here between uh, the, the barite and also some uh, sandstones, not much, and uh, a kind of plastic material. There are shallow basins, and uh, we see here this type of carbonates. There are chert carbonate beds. Very, very unique. And when you have a closer look to that, it looks like that. Looks like a bit of uh, evaporitic system, but it is one bed. And the gray material here that is uh, chert. And, but the entire rock here, the entire beds are impregnated with this chert. And you see here the brownish material that are the carbonates. And also we have some rosettes of uh, maybe aragonites, could be also sulfates. I'm, I'm not so sure what it was. But it's a type of a evaporitic mineral. So when we have a closer look to that, it's totally different to that what we have seen in the, uh, between the pillows. You see, this is one of these chert layers, and uh, this carbonate uh, crystals were precipitated in the, in the viscose chert, and then uh, sinking down uh, due to the density and also the size of the crystals, so this is a gradation, and uh, that is very, very common. And uh, the isotopes are also very typical, so they're always minus six, minus seven, so I think that uh, yeah, the source of the carbon is here, or the mantle source. And uh, the mineral, what is mainly precipitated here, the carbonate mineral is uh, Kutna horite. This is manganese dolomite, and normally uh, precipitates 
in, a, in hydrogen cylinder systems. So Kutnahora is a, is a, is a town in the in, uh, Czech Republic where it's this, it's first been described. But they are manganese rich. And that is maybe important. And then we have a closer look to that. We see, OK, that is uh, the dolomites, different concentrations here of, of calcite and, and magnesium. But more important are the distribution of, uh, of manganese. And uh, so the Kutna horite is uh, the final precipitation in the system. And we have seen similar things in the, in the Magadi chert, uh, the Magadi lake. And uh, then we have a well, uh, closer look to that. So this is a casudinuminescence pick. And also, often, uh, this uh, dolomites have an organic core. And we have a closer look to this core. We see this, this red dot. This is also a casudinuminescence pick image. And that is a bit the size of, of microbes. And they always form these rows. And it could be that. These are remains of uh, totally mineralized uh, micro microbes. And from today, uh, hydrothermal systems, we know that a lot of uh, bacteria are able to precipitate uh, Kutna horite. Huh? And so we use that as a, as a trace, as a, as a signature, a biosignature for uh, microbial pattern. So everywhere in these cores, we have found uh, this type of fabric. So that is a, maybe it's not a final proof, but it's, it's a hint that we had in this, in this uh, carbonate shield system an intense uh, microbial activity. Yeah, OK, that there is some organic carbon inside. And uh, so, but we were not able in the moment to distinguish it from, uh, uh, from a biological uh, organic matter or a biological organic matter. So that's one of the next steps what we want to do. Yeah, the rare earth elements uh, give us the same signature. We always have this uh, strong europium anomaly. And uh, nothing else, so uh, maybe some a weak yttrium, but I don't think so. That is really a good, a good, a good sign. It always looks like uh, this pattern, and uh, so I do not see uh, a strong marine influence. So Martin van Grandong, one of my my Australian uh, colleagues, I believe that there's a, a geysir system, and uh, so maybe it's very close to that uh, interpretation. Yeah, then we have uh, another type of uh, manganese-rich carbonates. And that we have found on uh, organic flakes. So I come back later again to this system. So uh, the entire North Pole area is uh, characterized uh, by these black shirt veins. And here's a very nice one. This is an old, old quarry where they have digged for, uh, for the barite. And, and you see here this nicely black, black material, very well preserved. And we have a closer look uh, to these veins. Uh, and uh, you see a lot of these flakes. Uh, that's organic matter. And this organic matter is uh, characterized by very low uh, that a certain C uh, values of minus uh, 35, minus 28 or so, that is a characteristic isotopic signature. But what we see sometimes is that uh, we have tiny little carbonate uh, balls on this uh, keratinous flakes. And uh, there's also a CL uh, peak, and the analysis have shown us that it's manganese-rich carbonates. So it was definitely not, uh, not a, a dolomite. It's, in the most cases, a type of a rhodochrosite. And uh, 
So you see it, how it looks like. So, okay, the uh, organic carbon content in this veins is uh, relatively high with 0.1 to 1%. I already told you the organic matter, the isotopic signature of this carotene, but it's always the same. So everywhere in this area, uh, the, carbon, uh, the, the organic matter has uh, the signature uh, also in this range. But the carbon isotopes of the rotocrosite, that is a little bit different, so they're very light, with minus 30 around. You see it here, this is one of these flakes. And you see here those blue dots. So here are the tiny little carbonate particles are enriched. But in this case, we also believe uh, that these things are remains of uh, microbes. That fits also with the idea that these flakes are maybe uh, products of uh, a type of a marine, marine snow. It is pumped in, I will show you later. And, uh, yeah? Why would uh, remains of microbes show up bright in the fact that Because they are extremely enriched in, in manganese, so for this reason I, I see it. Otherwise we would, we would not see it. But it's very, very simple method. So these carbonates are enriched in, uh, in manganese, and this manganese gives us a uh, very nice uh, red luminescence. And, uh, okay, back to, to a modern environment, which shows the same. So we have uh, in uh, very hot environments up to 100 degrees and more uh, type of pyrobaculum, Islandicum, and he produces also this type of rotocrosite. So we also have a, a modern example of this hyperthermophile. So we think that uh, uh, this rotocrosite remains uh, what we had here uh, could be also a sign, a biosignature for uh, hyperthermophilic life. The main problem is that uh, all this organic matter, what we can analyze, so it does not show us any Eichian bio, uh, biomarkers. So that is one of the, uh, the main problems that all of this isoprenoids would be need to, to really to prove, to prove it so we don't know where they are. So, so we expect from uh, the, the tree of life that uh, the Eichians must be there, but we have no possibility uh, to see directly the, the biomarkers. So maybe they are part of the carotene, but we have never really understood uh, how the isoprenoids get part of the carotene. So that's one of the most enigmatic things what we have in the moment in the understanding of the maturation of this uh, carotene as material. So we have to, to follow this ways. Yeah, that is the last example of the, of the carbonates, what we see in the, in the North Pole area, and that is famous because of this early, maybe the oldest really uh, stomatolytic, uh, or the carbonate stomatolytic uh, facies, that is a famous jelly pool carbonates. And you see uh, these nice laminations and uh, you see also here the structures, what we call Mickey Mouse, and, and they also have this cuneiform head. I know there's always a debate. You can produce the things also via the abiotic way, but in this particular case, it's, it's, it's so similar to that what we know from a true EPS-controlled uh, precipitation. So uh, I think it's very convincing to accept that these uh, stomatolites are really formed by uh, microbial biofilms or microbial mats. So it, it's a, a typical dolomite. And when we have a closer look to this dolomite, again, uh, the question with this cathode luminescence technique, you see if you have no uh, enrichment of, of manganese or other uh, ions in, in the crystal lattice, so you have a non-luminescent. Uh, behavior, so the core of this uh, dolomite is maybe more or less free of, of, of manganese, 
And then you have the diagenetic overgrowth uh, of uh, lots of uh, manganese bearing anaerobic waters that you have so the, the typical overgrowth, uh, luminescent overgrowth of the stolomite. This is exactly that what you see here in detail. Yeah, that is uh, how it looks like. So this environment starts with very big uh, crystals, crystal fans. So we have a, a pond with, with highly supersaturated uh, uh, water and a fast precipitation of this, of this uh, crystal fans. And on this crystal fans, you, you have the growth of the stromatolite. Sometimes you see some yeah, regularity, some, uh, some rhythmic uh, precipitation. There were some speculations. Some people have counted the, the laminae and have found the weeks and years, uh, but I do not believe in that. I think that is uh, one type product of metabolic activity on the, on the second uh, the diagenetic overprint. And you see it here that this uh, thin section of, of these crystal fans are extremely long. And you see the dark, uh, the white ones are the uh, micritic facies, and the dark ones are more transparent. And uh, so it shows a very strong uh, diagenesis. So I'm not completely sure what, what these uh, crystals were originally are. It also could be that maybe it was an argonite. I, I'm not quite sure. But the Siemens show, and also here, the precipitated dolomite, uh, that we have a very heavy, heavy carbon uh, signal uh, up to, to plus 4. And that is, that is very strange. It's normally that what we expect in, uh, yeah, in, in stomatolytic environments in, in, the, in the Proterozoic and also uh, today. So we see if we have a, a strong organic metaformation, so we have photosynthesis, for instance, so we have a, a strong depletion of, uh, of the light carbon. So the, in, the, in the rest of the dick uh, concentration, so we have the, the heavy carbon enriched, and this is used for the precipitation of the, of the carbonate. So that is uh, the, the heaviest values what we have in this time. And, and so that is also a good hint that we have an uh, active uh, biological formation of, of this organic matter. The rare earth elements also sh give us uh, a very strange pattern. It is a, a small a selection of, of that. And you see we have a, also a negative serum anomaly. It is sometimes interpreted that we have a bit uh, oxygenated water. But on the other hand, we also have uh, the influence of uh, hydrothermal fluids. And we have also a, a strong influence, again, from uh, marine water. Maybe that fits the negative serum anomaly and the positive yttrium anomaly. And, but we always have often an influence of uh, a second type of fluids, so hydrothermal fluids. Yeah, you can speculate maybe that is one of the oxygen oases in this time. And there is a heavy debate on that, but in any case, uh, it's clear that uh, this uh, rare earth element pattern, it uh, shows some similarities with modern systems, except here uh, this is inf strong influence sometimes, not always uh, from, from uh, hydrothermal water, anaerobic hydrothermal water. So when we summarize it now, so, so we see there's four different types of, of carbonate systems. So we have the most prominent ones, the precipitation of mainly calcite in the interpillar spaces. So the carbon isotope value around zero, the good seawater signal. Then we have here the transfer formation uh, carbonate shorts, Kutnahorite precipitation with uh, maybe a hydrothermal uh, source of the carbon and also precipitation 
of this carbonates uh, via maybe EPS controlled processes. Then we have here the uh, protectrosite uh, precipitation very closely related with this organic matter. We think that is a good, good hint for hyperthermophilic life. And we have also found it in all of these uh, black turrets. And then we have uh, the stomatolites, with, uh, the most heaviest uh, carbon values what we have. And we use that as a, as a side assets as a, as a good hint for yeah, maybe a type of a photosynthesis. So here we have some organic matter. Here we also, uh, there are some recent papers that have published something on, on keratinous material, but I had never seen keratinous material here in this carbonates, but in material what is precipitated on top of that, we will see it later. Finally, we see, okay, from a more or less abiotic precipitation of the carbonates, so we have a more or less organic matter controlled one, and I think the stomatolites from the uh, Stelly pool formation are the, the best uh, example for uh, biofilm EPS related uh, formation. Now to the second uh, carbon uh, archive. You have already seen that. That is the black turd veins uh, from the Jesse formation. They are extremely abundant. There are many different systems. Not only in the Jasa, we also have it uh, in, the, in the North Star, in, in the Mount uh, Ada basalt, in the Apex basalt, and also in the Euro basalt, everywhere we have these black shirt veins. And they have uh, different directions, different ages. There's uh, a cross network of that, and uh, nobody really has mapped that. There are lots of many papers on that, but uh, not so many have really studied uh, the structural geology of these things. When you have a closer look to all of that here, the dresser formation, you see a lot of this laminated uh, material. So it could be that we have on the margins of these veins or dikes uh, formation of, of biofilms and during the fluid formation and also the, all the processes in the way, and so we have liberated these things. The tiny little dark dots are mainly pyrite, they are very common, and they are always associated here with this laminated organic matter. You look at the, at the Raman signature, uh, you see that they are very, <laughs> very high, very sharp, so it's seen some temperature, uh, it's nearly graphite, but uh, we can easily distinguish between a D and a G band. And uh, so sometimes uh, it's, it's different. It's over a bit uh, dependent on the maturity and on the, on the situation in, in this uh, black shirt. I already told you that the, the carbon signature is always is minus 30 around. It's always the same. Yeah, how to deal it? And I think that is uh, really a challenge. So keratinous material to analyze, it's, it's not easy. And so we have chosen uh, to crack uh, this uh, keratinous material. And you have uh, mainly two, uh, two ways to do that. It is a standard pyrolysis, but this produces too much artifact. And so, so we have chosen to, to use this. Uh, Catalytic hydropyrolysis is high pi. And that is uh, a very nice system. You uh, have uh, 150 bar uh, hydrogen pressure. Uh, you have a continuous flow, and you heat it up up to 520. And then you crack the bonds on certain places, and, and, and you produce an artificial bitumen. And this artificial bitumen you can yeah, analyze with the standard uh, GC MS technique. So, and that was extremely successful. And uh, 
So we have found some uh, very intriguing patterns of, of the N-alkanes. Uh, so, yeah, the pyrolysate. So there was a suggestive pyrolysate. And in all cases, we have a major step by, by the carbon number 18. So the higher ones uh, make back with it. So it's, they disappear. So we have always an enrichment of, of NIKs up to, to the carbon number 18, and then it's over. It was the same with the cyanobacterium. What we have used up to the same. And we have more examples of that. It's always the same. So we use this uneven uh, pattern, which we use. We believe it's a typical biological uh, uh, signature. When we have a fissure tropsch product for a comparison, so we see a typically only model distribution, so not as big slabs. And uh, so that is, in any case, an abiotic formation of organic matter. And uh, so in this comparison, uh, which is that what we have found from this keratinous material, so we believe that. This material, what we have released from this carotene, is a uh, microbial, of microbial origin, or definitely of biological origin, because it's always a problem. Yes. Yeah, but <laughs> yes, we we have not. Uh, it is not nearly graphite, so, so it is. Uh, it's it's nearly graphite, but it is not graphite. Yeah. So and and these experiments, also the maturation experiments, what we have made, uh, uh, has always shown the same the same pattern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the aromatics are here. Yeah, this uh, this material. Yeah, uh, that is the result. Uh, so the aromatics you have here, that is uh, the aromatic material. Uh, it's there. And, uh, and we always have this, this step by, by carbon number 18. Yeah. So we use that as a, uh, as a good biosignature for, for, for biological origin. But we do not have it here by, by the Fischer Topsch product. So it's, it's not there. I mean, I've thought about why, why it is the case. So, OK, I think that this the length of here of this fatty acid they have always around uh, this uh, carbon number 18, 16, 18, and so that is uh, the most important. And OK, we have, we have no chances to, to see the, the bigger ones. So it's gone. Maybe that is here is the stearanes or uh, hopanes. Uh, maybe they are altered to this ar aromatic compound. So uh, that is, uh, it's a bit a taphonomic problem. But we think that uh, the main answer is that we, we have a, a definite length of this fatty acids, and that is the, the predominance of that preferences. The second, the second example, what we had uh, studied more closely, is uh, a bedded, a bedded black shirt that is directly located on top of the of the stratipus stromatolites. We call it the zebra fabrics, and uh, maybe have a closer look to that. We see this um, keratinous laminations, and you see the tiny little bright dots that are the pyrite, that is uh, frambuidal pyrite, which is uh, enriched in, in this, in this or, uh, located enriched in this laminae. And I think that is uh, yeah, a product of also of reducing, sulfate reducing microbes. I well, made a lot of uh, nanosims analysis to, to study a bit more uh, this uh, pool material. So often we see this round-shaped structures. And uh, 
in the core of that, we also have this carbonate. It's also rich in manganese. And on the margins, we see that we have the light uh, carbon enriched there, also the, the light sulfur, and on the other side, too. And we believe that here in the center, we have the, uh, the carbonate that give us the signature. So maybe these are remains of cellular structures. Yeah, yeah also we see here that we have an, uh, 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 Topsons analysis and the relationship between the organic matter and, and the carbonates. So it's in this particular case also very evident. So, of course, it's not 100% proof of uh, its biological origin of that. But uh, including all the other structures what we see, and also the petrographic analysis uh, fits with that. Yeah, the idea of uh, the enrichment of this organic matter in this, in this uh, black chert veins is that we think we have an increased uh, pumping of water, the hydrothermal pump. And so that is valid for the, for the basalts. We see that a lot of seawater is coming in and, and bring uh, the signatures there. And we believe that most of this organic matter was formed uh, in, the, um, in the water column. And uh, so, and due to the uh, yeah, processes, what we know from today on hydrothermal fluids, so that probably we have the, the formation of this carotenous flakes here in this, uh, in this black shirt uh, due to an increased uh, pumping of seawater through the uh, the oceanic crust. The question is why uh, we have that, so we can maybe discuss it later, that I believe that a lot of the tidal forces of the moon uh, was, was a strong uh, force to, to, uh, to break up the oceanic crust, and so we have a lot of water which is pumping through the oceanic crust. And the, the third example, what I show you, is that is that what we just have started to do, to look for carbon-based uh, molecules here in this black bar, right? So it's a really stinky bar, and when I hit with a hammer on that, uh, it's really an awful. Uh, uh, it stinks, really. And the question, why? So it's full with uh, fluid inclusions, and uh, the barrel is really black. It, it's it's not white. And you see here on the front of the of, of the crystal growth, you have the enrichment of uh, of mineral inclusions and also fluid inclusions. We have lots of uh, black material in in the barite. That is type of organic matter. And some of these fluids also have a strong uh, fluorescence. So it's really liquid. And we could uh, distinguish the different uh, mineral inclusions. So we have a lot of sphalerite. It's very important. So it's the main uh, sulfidic phase beside uh, some pyrites, and also we have lots of carbonates inside. So this are again this manganese uh, dolomite, and this sphalerite is always associated with a lot of this keratinous material. I do not know exactly why it is so. Maybe it is a catalytic process, and uh, that I think it's it's one of the intriguing observations what we have made there. And uh, the carbonates are restricted to this manganese dolomites, and they're always associated with pyrite and not with uh, sphalerite. 
And that is also an important thing. That's another example of that. And uh, we have also pyrite embedded a bit in, in, in the barite, so tiny little, tiny little crystals. It looks like maybe also has the shape of, of microbes if you want. And what we see also by the, by the fluids inclusions that we are on the margins, we have to see, uh, see here this dark rim, that is this organic matter, and also associated always with pyrite. And uh, yeah, so the fluids inclusions itself, so we have used uh, different systems, but I show you only here the thermal desorption. And uh, uh, what we have made, and so we have found uh, yeah, methane inside, and CO or NO2, uh, N2. We, I'm, I'm not, we, at the moment, we cannot distinguish that, but I think it's CO. Then we have CO2, of course. Then we have H2S. Then we have here carbonic, uh, uh, the COS. And also we have found acidic acid. I think that was also important. Water, of course. And here we too, mercaptan, and the very stinky stuff is here, this carbon uh, disulfid. So that is a nice set of, of, of so-called prebiotic molecules, if you want. So the entire black uh, barite is full with this type of, of, of fluids. And uh, so we also have uh, analyzed uh, sulfur isotopes of the sulfates. And uh, this was very surprising to see how light they are. That's the lightest what we have. It's minus 15, though the barite is relatively heavy. So that there's a fractionation of more than uh, 20 per mil. And that is, I think, a good hint for an early uh, sulfate reduction process. But the carbonates is, was also very surprising to see that we have this extremely light uh, carbon, with minus 20 or so. And that is maybe important because uh, the methane, so we, unfortunately, we have not measured uh, the isotopic signature of the methane by, by us, but uh, the Japanese colleague Oeno has made it, and he has found uh, minus 60 or so the same localities. And uh, so it could be <coughs> so that we have the first hint of a coupled system between uh, yeah, methane oxidation and, and sulfate reduction. So that could be an, an early signal of uh, anaerobic oxidation of methane. So if it is really, we can prove that uh, with, with more analysis of that, so it will be very important that we have a 3.5 uh, billion year old uh, anaerobic uh, methane oxidation, probably based on uh, on microbes, so on archaeans, probably. Yeah, the final result is that uh, we have type of microbial mat formation on top of the uh, of the barite that are. Here from, from some old boreholes, so we could uh, investigate this type of uh, somatolites. And we see a nice system of uh, sphalerytic uh, lamination and also pyrite, and associated with carbonates on, on top of this uh, barite uh, mineralization event. And uh, yeah, give you an idea. So that was really uh, a very mobile, a very, very um, soft uh, material in the formation of that. So the, that is reflected light, so that is pyrite, and here inside that is phthalerite. And also when you have a closer look here to, to this pyrite, you see everywhere this, uh, this filamentous, filamentous structures. I, so you here with some of those tiny little red uh, lines. So we have in all of these cases, so we can see uh, uh, preserved uh, microbial mat situation. 
the associated carbonates with them uh, do not show any uh, microbial uh, influence. But we see also here in, in the core of this of this dolomites, like in the in the dresser uh, things I have already shown you the organic cores, and but it's a strict uh, hydrothermal uh, event. Yeah, and so on the surface it looks like this type. So we have a bedded pyrite, pyrite, and it's always encrusted here by this iron stromatolites, but here on the surface it's now uh, iron hydroxides, but it's always the same. Barite, stromatolite, barite, stromatolite, and uh, up to 10, 15 meters, uh, you have that. And they were famous because they were the first time described, I've forgotten from whom, uh, the state of Kata, that's uh, the, the earliest. Uh, stomatolites they have found, but uh, we know now that this uh, iron hydroxide stomatolites were former uh, a sulfidic material. And uh, so we think that is a, a simple model. So you have the sparate veins, so we have lots of them, and then you have this runs out, the sparate fluids. So evaporates or precipitates, and on top of that, we have the formation of the stromatolites, and then you have the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So that is, that is the situation. And also important is that these things are completely penetrated by, by, a, by a chert matrix. So I think we had, at this time, a highly viscous uh, SU two fluids, and we also see the, the feeder uh, fractures from which places uh, this fluids may come in. So that is the situation, and maybe one of the most developed uh, biological system in, in the early archaean. Yeah, so when we put it all together, so we see that we have uh, fluid inclusions with, yeah, what call it prebiotic organic molecules. So we have extremely light uh, sulfidic uh, material. Well, we think that has something to do with, with a very intense sulfate reduction. Also the, the carbon in, in, this, uh, in this manganese rich dolomites are very, very light and always associated with pyrite. So, so we think that there is a close uh, metabolic uh, combination type of a, a symbiosis, if you want. So that's what we know from today. So the AOM based on, on uh, sulfate reduction. And we have the sulfidic stromatolites, finally a bit on the marine influence, but it's always associated with this uh, bedded pyrite. So maybe they also get uh, some of this nutrients, what they need. Uh, from the uh, fluid inclusions from the pyrite. Uh, so I'm in an end now. So we are a small group of people working on that. So this is Jan Peter Duda. He's now in, in Riverside with Gordon Lab working with the calcineous material. So he is in charge with the, with the HiPi, with Helge Miesbach. I just finished his PhD by the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research. So he is in the Excel Mouse 2020 uh, group, and he has made all of the uh, fischer tropsch reactions. So as Volker Thiel, he is uh, responsible for the organic matter laboratory and for the biomarkers, and yeah, I'm doing something with the carbonates. Yeah, then thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully it was not too long, and I give you a short overview and said uh, what we in a moment are doing. I, I, I have expected that we, we should have more of, of dolomite because it is an anaerobic environment and it's not so easy to do it with, with, uh, with the calcite, but it is calcite and so the most of them, so we have dolomite and also 
anchorite uh, high amount, but that we have so much calcite as opposed to tritium in two C. Yes. Yeah, so we, we have a very strong uh, reaction of, of the seawater uh, with, uh, with this glassy rims. Uh, and so you have uh, a release of these cations from, from the face bars and, and, and so on, and, and it's enriched in, in these compartments. Yeah. And uh, so that, that is the reason why we have this. So I have also made some, some um, calcium isotope measurements from the carbonates and also from the basalts, and it was quite similar. So we see that so the cations are coming from the basalts and, 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 and the anions, and most of them, so the bicarbonates and other carbonates are coming from the seawater. And I think that, that's important that uh, this fluid is not a hydrothermal fluid, so it's seawater fluid. Yeah. What's the fundamental difference? Uh, the funny thing is that we see that uh, the difference of the, of the Archean seawater and the modern seawater is not so big. Uh, so it's maybe the same, more or less. So. The problem is that we do not know exactly now the, the ionic uh, concentration of the Archean seawater, but that what we know is it's not so far away from the seawater today. And uh, most surprising was to see that uh, the, the, the dick, so the inorganic carbon values are the same. Uh, so, say, in that area, has it become the carbon interconnected? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, you see that uh, we have this enormous amount of, of, uh, of seawater, the carbon in the seawater, and this, this has more or less zero or plus one or minus one, so in this circle. And uh, that reflects uh, the precipitation in the, in the carbonates and in, in this, uh, in this oceanic crust. Uh, otherwise, you can expect that you have uh, hydrothermal uh, fluids are coming, what we see from in the, the dresser formation with this matured carbonate beds with this Kutner horite. So, so we have a, a hydrothermal vent system there, maybe a continental one close to the guys here. So we have a totally different source of carbon. And the CO2 has minus six, minus seven, and it is that what normally a monkey carbon has. Yeah, I, I am not sure how we can uh, compare the barium uh, of, of today with this uh, barium deposit uh, from there. So it's a really big, uh, big barium deposit, and uh, you already have seen it, what we have made. So you have a significant amount of aeros elements inside and uh, also other trace elements. I have not seen in, in the, the barium precipitates what, what I have studied. Uh, in the environment of cold seeps that we have the same pattern, so it's what's totally different. Yeah. So, uh, a viable yeah, I have also to think about that, but uh, the only, the only, uh, yeah, we need, we need this uh, light carbon from from the methane. Normally, the the, the the methane is normally has not this light uh, signature. Yeah? Uh, and and so in this particular case, I must explain. 
how in this carbonates uh, from air is, uh, is the light carbon coming? I agree. I don't and, and, and that is, uh, from my experience, uh, only <laughs> the best way to, to explain it. Maybe there are some other hidden, hidden, hidden pathways. I don't know, but, but uh, I think it's so obvious. So I have worked for, for many decades with this AOM system. So. <laughs> Yeah. Very yeah. Yeah, you are right, but uh, so that is based now on a, on a, on a sample set of, of seven analysis, and uh, so, and especially is, uh, the data uh, 33 and 36, so that is that what next is on, on the topic to, to understand better that. And, uh, but that is uh, the only, the, all the other uh, sulfidic material what we have, Analyzed so the pyrites from 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 the jelly pool and from from the black dirt. Ah, that is always a bit weak. So Harald Strauss has made the uh, sulfur isotope analysis, and when he had seen uh, had measured this uh, minus 15, minus 18 or more, he was really uh, surprised uh, to see that. Yeah. And uh, I, but I cannot explain it to you how how it works in the moment. But that this uh, is a fluid inclusions in uh, in, in this pyrite. Yeah. But you have to you have to uh, to explain the fractionation of more than twenty per mil. Yeah. And and we have also the organic matter there. So uh, especially by by the by the swalerite. So so we have always this keratinous material. And uh, from the today, uh, sulfate reduction systems, where sphalerite uh, plays a role, that's only in in, uh, in this uh, yeah, some hydrothermal systems, so up to 100, 100 to 120. They also have a high temperature sulfate reduction. They produce this sphalerite, and I see the same. So it could be a very 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 old uh, biological system, microbial system. It's the same. Yes. Uh, the problem is with this, uh, with this jelly pool, so, so this is a tiny little outcrop. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, the trend locality this is very famous. And in, in nowhere you have a sign, it's not allowed to collect so much rice. <laughs> Okay, but it is a belt. So the steady pool formation is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not only restricted to this area. And, and so, but uh, the preservation conditions are different. So, but the trend locality, it's, uh, yeah, not so good. When you, when you go over the shore river, so, and nobody knows exactly locality, but it's a big river, you can cross it, uh, now it's dry, you can go over the three-kilometer walk through a, through a river, and on the other side, you, you have this, uh, so much lights, and uh, it's very nicely preserved. But it is the same what what, what Allwood had published. Yeah. But it's good to see that most of the data was there obtained, and what we had, uh, uh, say, fit, but not all. Yeah. And, and so, so the diatomaceous play many, many, many. But we all agree that uh, 
the Sharipur stromatolites are the first uh, stromatolites. What, yeah, when you read the textbook and they talk about stromatolites, and so that it could be the first good fabric of carbonate stromatolite. Uh, you know, there are you know, some findings from, 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 uh, from, from Greenland, and so uh, uh, it's a bit problematic. They're only tiny little things. Like I don't know what it is, but but this uh, Stelly pool things I think are the first, probably photosynthetic related precipitation of a microbial matter system. Uh, thank you for the thank you. patient and <laughs> the good I love it. questions. Uh,